Okay. Thank you, Peter, for that for wonderfully telling us exactly what has happened. And um, it feels sort of strange to come up and preach after the Apostle Peter. So, not that I'm privileged. Weird things are happening in the world. A couple of days ago, I was flipping through news on my phone. Uh, almost, I realized that almost 400 dead whales washed up on the, on the shore of uh, Tasmania's west coast. And I wasn't really all that surprised by it. We've had a lot of hurricanes, and again, that's just one of those things that for me, I just kind of flip through because it doesn't affect me much. I, just, I googled hurricane because I could remember something about hurricanes happening. And the first couple entries that came up, zombie tropical storm, and then ginormous storm Teddy 1,000 miles wide. Now, I'm sure these titles are a little bit sensational, but they didn't come from the Inquirer. It seems to not be fake news. These things seem to be happening. We are living in uncertain times. Strange times. The world is changing. The United States is changing. The church evangelicalism is changing and even to an extent, Anchor Community Church is changing. And in all likelihood, things will never exactly go back to the way that they have been. The ancient uh, Greek philosopher Heraclitus says, change is unchanging. In his world, the only thing that doesn't change is that things change. The title of my sermon this morning is The Times They Are a Changing. And again, our text is going to be Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. And it's here that we're going to learn how to cope with change, particularly tragic change. And of course, we're going to learn that the secret to coping and handling change is to hold firm to our hope in Jesus Christ. Now, if we think that the events that are happening in the world around us are hard to handle, how much more for the people in Acts chapter 1? Let's take a step back and just think about what's happening uh, from the apostles' point of view. The disciples have taken an incredible leap of faith. If we were to think about Peter being a real person, like we just saw him come up, they had risked everything and had gone through incredible change because the 12 disciples were persuaded that the kingdom of God was at hand. Good change was going to happen. And they had seen incredible things. They had seen lepers cleansed. They had seen blind people receive their sight. They had seen uh, the dead raised. And, and even more than that, they somehow were a part of it. Jesus had sent them out, and they preached, and they did the miracles. Things that they had never imagined possible. Incredible change. But then, of course, things change again. Their whole world was turned upside down as they saw the one upon whom they had hung all of their hopes and all of their expectations hung on a cross, crucified, executed, tortured, humiliated. In their mind, they'd have to go back home with their tail between their legs. You could probably just imagine all the, the jeers. So, Peter, how was change in the world? How was destroying the Romans? Back so soon? They were wrong. They'd have to just eat their piece of humble pie, go home and admit it. Go back to fishing and tax collecting and whatever the other guys did. But no, three days later, a short amount of time, and things 
changed again. And they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. This meant they didn't go home. The project was still on. It was all part of God's plan. The crucifixion was undone somehow. They had, the world had then been flipped back the way it was supposed to be. Only sort of. Things were back, but yet everything was new. I imagine that there must have been some sort of excitement. Have you ever done public speaking? I know I make it look really easy, but it's intimidating, and it doesn't matter how many times you've done it, when the person says, all right, and now so-and-so is up, you get this kind of nervous feeling in your stomach. Oh no, it's me. Maybe if I just don't get up, no one will notice. Or do you remember the first time that you learned how to drive a car? You would watch your mom and dad do it, okay, break on the, uh, I can't remember now, break on the left, gas on the right, uh, uh, let's see the, this is what the white lines mean, this is what the yellow lines mean, and, and you've gone through the books, but then it's actually your turn. And you sit in the driver's seat, and, and the key is actually to turn the ignition on. And you press the brake and, and put the car into drive, and the car is listening to you, sort of. There's this excitement that comes. You've been watching it happen, and now it's your turn, you're up. That's the feeling that I imagine the apostles had. They see a world of change ahead of them, and they realize, okay, now it's my turn, I'm up. As we watch them wait for Pentecost, okay, things are just about to begin, we get important insights as to how to handle periods of change, when things are transitioning to something new. Now our text comes in three sections. There's a setting in 1, 12 to 15. Verses uh, 16 to 22 record the speech of Peter. And verses 23 to 26 describe the actions which are then taken. Now each of these three sections correspond to three characters. The, the, the first main character is Peter. Spotlight falls on him when he's talking about the setting. Then the spotlight falls on Judas as he shows some of the background information. And then lastly, we have this strange character named Matthias. Now, there are important lessons to learn as we compare the, the first character and the second, and then again the second and the third. Uh, the, comparing the first and the second teaches us how to handle moral failure. In comparison, the second and the third, that is Judas and Matthias, teaches us how to handle missional failure. So, moral failure and missional failure. I apologize for the corny alliteration, but just as I was typing it out, it just flows right out. So, uh, the first section of our text gives us the setting. They are in an upper room. Now, since it's in Jerusalem, some have guessed that this is the location of the Last Supper. Of course, we don't know. Um, however, Luke's desire is to focus on this 120 people. It must have been a large place, wherever it was. Uh, it lists the 11 apostles, which is important because of Judas' downfall. He's not there. In addition, verse 14 says that there were women. This probably refers to the women who ministered to Jesus and even were there at his crucifixion. As we've seen, and then we'll continue to see, Luke is careful to point out for his readers the important place that women have in the drama of redemption. Now we're also told that Mary was there. And to disambiguate her from all the other Marys in first century Palestine, it is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now what's she doing? Well, as I'm sure we're aware of, some people have taken the ball and, and run with it when it comes to Mary. And other people in response have said nothing about Mary. Again, there's this polarization, but this one has been going on for a long, long time. But Mary is just so 
somewhat important figure, but notice how I'm going to describe her. She is praying, as she was praying in Luke chapter 1 and 2 in the introduction. Notice the corporate nature of the prayer. We read, all of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary and Jesus' brothers. Uh, there's just no hint that Mary is exalted or receives any other position besides being one of the brothers. This term is used in verse 15 and 16. Now, it might strike us as strange that Mary is described as one of the brothers. What's going on with the term brothers? Let's just pause and think about that for a little bit, because a lot of us um, know that there's a background of being called brethren or brothers. Uh, the word technically, of course, is masculine, but it doesn't mean that all the reference are male. That's just not the way that it's used in the literature. Um, it would be similar to the English word guys. Sometimes when we say you guys, we mean everybody. And sometimes we can say, okay, guys on this side, girls on this side. And what we mean by that is that uh, boys and girls are males and females. Sometimes the gender is important and sometimes it's not important. The way the Bible uses the term in many contexts is that it includes men and women, and that clearly is the case here. Mary is one of the brothers. She's one of the brethren. It doesn't stand in distinction with the sistren. Brethren includes everybody. Notice the, the, the level ground there is here in the early church. They're all there together, and they're all praying. And yet we read with almost symbolic significance the words of verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. And from here on through about halfway through the book of Acts, we will see Peter as was called the primus inter pares, the Latin for first among equals. Technically, he's got no official position greater than any of the other apostles. And yet he's constantly the, the leader of the group, the spokesman, the one that everybody looks to. So he is the one who voices this speech and directs the, uh, the group of the apostles. Luke here is shining the spotlight on Peter, and we shouldn't miss this. From our perspective, it's just obvious. Okay, Peter's speaking. Of course Peter's speaking. Peter's always the guy who speaks whenever it's the apostles. What, are you going to expect Thaddeus to speak? No, of course it's going to be Peter. But let's not miss what's happening. Now, the last time that Luke has mentioned Peter, we saw him looking into the tomb, seeing the absence of Jesus' body, and just being shocked. Not a real insight into his character. The last time that he really occurs, into which we really see him, is when he is denying knowing the Lord. You remember the scene, of course, don't you? Peter has sworn that he will never deny the Lord, that he will be true until death. And then it's almost as if he's given a nice underhand pitch. All right, let's see how you can testify for Christ. And a little girl says, you were with Jesus, weren't you? Swing and a miss. Three times. He was out. In fact, he calls down curses that he does not know the man. And yet, here he is, the priest of the Paris, leader among the apostles for crying out loud. What happened? Put that back to back with Judah. Now, again, we know the story, but we shouldn't cloud, let that cloud us from seeing what's happening in Luke Acts. The last time we read about Judas is when he was with the mob who has come to arrest Jesus. Judas has also denied the Lord. Dot, dot, dot. He exploded from the insides and his guts fell out on the ground. No, that's a gross, disgusting picture. 
it, we might wonder, wait a minute, so they both deny the Lord, these disciples. Dot, 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 something happens, and Peter is the primus inter pares, and Judas is dead with his guts on the ground. What happened in that dot, dot, dot? Well, what makes the difference between a Judas and a Peter? Luke, by push, pushing these characters back to back, is forcing us to think about why are they different? Well, they both screwed up pretty bad. But what do these is well, I can grant that Judas' offenses it was worse. But most importantly, both offenses were forgivable. Uh, ese es el problema. For what they had done. Peter oh, yeah. looks and weeps bitterly. I call him, yeah. Now, Luke does not explain for us exactly uh, Judas's actions, but I take it that this is just because it was so well known that he assumes it. And he goes up and he tragically takes his own life. As Matthew records for us, he hangs himself. Overwhelmed with grief, he can see no way forward. Amanda Kerner said. Why the difference? It's a very example for Judas, such a vivid character. But the point isn't this don't be a Judas, don't mess up. You must endure it, and if you don't, this is what happens. That's the way that character is sometimes taken. Don't you stop being a faithful Christian because if you do, look, look, look what could happen. I don't know this to screw This misses the personal comparison by Matthew, Mark, and Luke between Judas and Peter. They both mess up. The difference is what they do afterwards. Peter gets up and he goes back to the room. Of the, of, of the apostles. He goes back up, he dusts himself off, off, he wipes away his tears, he meets again with the apostles. He doesn't give up because he trusts in the mercy of Jesus. Judas is also filled with remorse. Where he, he fails is not so much his repentance from one perspective, but it's instead his faith in the grace of Jesus. He ends the way he does believes only that there can be no hope for him. Perhaps you have been in a similar situation yeah. as these characters. Perhaps you've woken up one morning and you just put your head in your hands and you thought, what have I done? I had said that I would never did. And there's no going back. You woke up to the reality of the world a lot worse. In moments like that, as great as our grief can be, it should never be greater than our faith in the mercy and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus. As he dies on the cross, he pays the price for all sin. He knew the heart's fall of people. And he stands ready to forgive. The Bible is crystal clear about his promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I have the personal details of what actually happens to Judas, which we just discussed. There's another, another issue here going on, and we, we get at this by comparing the second to the third, that is between Judas and Matthias. Not only has Judas ethically failed, but because of that, it means that now there's an open seat at the apostles' table. There's in fact a play on words here. Verse 17, that Judas was given a lot in their ministry. Judas falls from his lot, and so the lot, same word there, must fall on someone else. Uh, the Greek word is capable of both meanings. In the first, it means share or portion. 
And in the second inning, they're maybe pulling short straws like we saw earlier, or more likely the, the practice of putting names on a stone, shaking it in a jar, and the first one to come out was the lucky winner. Let's start by thinking about the way Judas losing his lost blame. Uh, this could have been a major embarrassment for Christianity. Okay, so there's this guy who's walking around Palestine preaching the good news, and he, he wants to get a bunch of followers, and the best he could find was, was, were these guys, the people who left him, the people who turned him into his own death. That's the kind of charisma he had. Or critically laugh at this. So, clarification is in order. Peter explains that Judas's desertion was predicted by Scripture. It had to be this way all along. Jesus has known this, that the plan of God was that the Messiah would suffer and die and then enter into his glory. So when we see Jesus praying all night in the Gospel of Luke, deciding whom he would choose to be the twelve apostles, we should see this as a foreshadowing of Gethsemane. He knows what Judas will do. He's and, and, and he's wrestling with God and he chooses the betrayer. In fact, it was for this reason that Judas is specifically chosen that the scripture might be fulfilled. Peter illustrates this by quoting from the Psalms. Psalm 69, the first one, is often used in the New Testament as a messianic psalm. Uh, now, forgive a little bit of grammar. He quotes it pretty closely from the Old Testament, both in Greek and Hebrew, although he makes one difference that I have to point out. If you go back and look at it in your Bible, in Psalm 69, you'll notice, from the New students, that the pronouns that are used in that verse are plural. It says, May their camp be a desolation, let no one live in their tents. Huh. But Luke records Peter as saying, may his camp become desolate, and let there no one to be no one to dwell in it. The point then is not so much that the scriptures predict that there would be this one specific person named Judas who would betray the Messiah. Instead, there's this theme in the Psalms that the Messiah would have opp opposition, that people would fail him, that people would desert him, that people would turn against him. There is this group of people, plural, and then this is applied specifically, singular, to Judas. Now I make this point because in the story of the Bible, the righteous have always been opposed, and Jesus is no exception. And when this happens, when people fall off, we should not be surprised. We should be sad, but not surprised. It's been going on for thousands of years. It doesn't take God by surprise. We should remember that judgment awaits them. Because we should not be surprised what happens when it, what should we do when it does happen? We should do what the apostles did. Realize that God knew about this all along. Pick yourselves up. And you quote from the Psalms, may another take his place. In other words, the show must go on. There's, there can be remorse, but there also needs to be replacement. We can press on in difficult circumstances, uh, like the ones the apostles face, because ultimately our faith is not in the team that we've assembled together. Let me say this, I have hope, I have confidence in the church, in the church of Jesus Christ. But it's not because I'm persuaded that, boy, we've got a great generation of scholars who know all the answers to all the questions. We've got some really charismatic leaders. It is because my faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ who continues to build his church. And that is why the gates of hell do not prevail against it. It is because Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. 
It is because the scriptures have foretold this. And if that's not enough, we'll read next week, it's because the Holy Spirit lives within the church. And he is not a force to be taken lightly. Now this confidence in moving forward during unexpected times of change, We can see this with their appointment of the Twelve. There's kind of like this ominous ring to it. The Twelve. Think about it this way. Jesus picked the Twelve. Was it because that's just who we can find? That can't be the case. Because when one of them defects, they don't just say, all right, everybody, looks like our team name has changed. From now on, we're the Eleven. Now that won't do. Well, they got to meet certain criteria, right? He said, so they list that off? Well, it turns out that there's two people who meet that criteria. Well, I know what we'll do. We'll just now become the 13, right? Can't be the 13. Everybody knows there can't be 11 disciples. There can't be 13 disciples. There has to be 12 disciples. There has to be 12 apostles. Why? Because Jesus picked 12 apostles to reach the 12 tribes of Israel. He picked the 12 disciples. Notice this. It's not because Israel is being replaced or because Jesus is creating a new Israel. Israel, the 12 tribes are not being replaced. Look earlier in the book of Acts in chapter 1, it is because they are being restored. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were to wait. And as they're waiting, they assemble the restoration team. God does not give up on his plan. Jesus' plan never fails. Ah, oh, well, but they crucified Jesus. You don't understand. They crucified him. Uh-oh. That changes the mission of God. Plan B, not at all. Absolutely not. In the words of Paul, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Think about the incredible amount of faith. They just saw the religious leaders crucify their Lord, and they said, God's not done with them yet. We're getting the band back together, and we're the 12 will be assembled. This shows incredible continuity between Luke and Acts. They stay true to their course. All the missional ideas that we found in Luke, we can't just say, yeah, that was for another time. That's not what the apostles think. They think they're continuing on the same mission. Sometimes the church is described as a parenthesis in the plans and purpose of God. Let me just say I do not see that here. Instead, I see the church, the apostles, gearing up to carry out the same mission as we found in Luke. Restarting the twelve, preparing the process of restoring, not replacing, Israel. Now the implications again of this are huge. It means that the mission that we're on is the same mission that Jesus Christ was on. All the things that were important to Jesus were important to the disciples, and they should still be important to us. I can't help but think of these messages that Ben Matthew gave a while ago. Remember the PowerPoint that he had of the way of the disciples and the sorts of things, the sorts of mission that Jesus was on with the poor and the outcast on one side. You remember this? Some people do, some people don't. Okay, you remember it. Okay. That's never been revoked. That plan is still in mission. That's still happening. The mission of Acts is the mission of Luke. So what can we say about these things? Our world, our country, our church is going through change. The times, they are changing. We have an opportunity to be like the apostles, to look around with excitement and say, okay, Lord, so what are we going to do?
How do we cope? We have an anchor in the time of storm. When the waves of our personal failure smack against us, what do we do? We hold on to the anchor of Jesus Christ. When difficulties and frustrations come from the outside and things aren't going the way that we had planned, we don't give up. We say, well, just let another take his office. We move on. I like to close this message by reading the words of a hymn. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Father, thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for your purposes, your plans. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. When our moral failures seem insurmountable, we rest on your unchanging grace. When it seems like we're confused and don't know the way forward with our mission, we trust in your power. Again, we trust in your promises. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.